and Classic Value Investors. This is Mario Skoniecznie. I am talking with Arnold, the author of the newly released book, Private Placement Profits. Arnold, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me, Marius. I, as you know, I'm a big fan of your show. Thank you. So uh, from what I understand, this is your, uh, this is not the first book you wrote, but this is your first book that you published uh, uh, by yourself, like self-published. Yes. So I guess uh, some, before we get into the book, like, you know, walk us through, like, what you, what did you do? What kind of experience did you have publishing it? And obviously it's a little different than publishing it the other way. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, it was a lot of fun, and it was actually a lot easier than I thought. I did look out at a bunch of services to help you publish your book, and most of them were charging between you know six and ten thousand dollars to help you take your Word document and actually have it for sale on Amazon. And I'm I'm in the tech business. I've been working with Microsoft and technology since uh, 1982. So I figured if I can put together enterprise systems, I can obviously figure this out. So I, I've got a corporation already. I, I set up a doing business as, contacted Library and Archives Canada on their website, opened up, a, registered a new account for free. Within 24 hours, they sent me my account information. I registered the three ISBN numbers. And you want to set up your own publishing company. Uh, which is really quite simple. It doesn't cost that much money, but you want to set that up because you want to own your ISBN. You don't want somebody else to possess the ISBN. You want to own it. So my punk publishing company owns the ISBNs for my books. And um, uh, I realized my limitations. I'm not a graphic artist. So I went on to, you know, one of the main websites where you can hire people. And uh, I found some a creative designer I really liked. I think he did a great job on the book cover. I found two editors uh, who came highly recommended. And these are all these were people I engaged for you know two, three hundred dollars. You know, it wasn't like a significant amount of money, but I wanted the quality of the book to be better. And uh, finally, I hired a one final guy for about a hundred bucks to format the book. So it fit the appropriate format that Kindle and uh, uh, Amazon uh, and Insta, uh, Ingram Spark are expecting. So Ingram Spark and Amazon are the two big distributors. And you can either go whole hog Amazon or you can go what they call wide. And I decide to go wide and make my book available, both in ebook and paperback and hardcover from both distribution networks. The whole process probably took about, you know, um, over time, probably about a month to get all set up, but that was a little bit here, a little bit there. And uh, there was a number of revisions you go through, um, but the, the Amazon and the uh, Ingram Spark websites are fairly easy to work with. You just have to bring a passionate idea to the table. Um, and that, of course, is where the real work is, is putting your thoughts to paper. Now, I studied journalism. I was actually a journalist when I got out of college and I was a journalist for a year. So I have a, a writing background. Um, and then I went on to <clears throat> work in a bunch of other industries, like the recording industry, uh, music industry. And, and um, you know, there was just no money in it. And people were selling their souls to be part of it. And so I fell into computers. And I've written a lot of white papers. I'm actually certified as a professional cloud architect for Azure and for Google. Um, and that's part of what I do is my business as I provide consulting services to help organizations leverage cloud technology these days. And I also teach for a living. I've written a number of courses and teach as well. So I have a bit of a publishing background, I guess. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. So with your background, now you come up with this book, Private Placements, which is not necessarily in the <laughs> field that you work yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, and And private placements are not something that the general investing public knows it exists so like how did you come how did you find them how did you learn about them and what what made you want to do this book well um i just like the idea of publishing a story you know blogs and things like that and um uh, last spring so the spring uh, spring 2020 so let's go through the the the, 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 the calendar there as you talked about in your pre-release video um, in the spring of 2020, I decided, okay, I'm going to put 5,000 aside and I'm going to strategically think about some, 
uh, startup companies or evolving companies in the area of mining and in the area of technology. And I wanted to find some that, you know, as, as, as per the classic value investor, that you're going to believe in and hold for a long time, or at least for a good number of years. And um, I also knew I didn't want to get into the typical commodities like gold and silver mining. I wanted to find something that was a little bit more rare. And so I started looking into the different, you know, commodities and helium struck me as something that eh, there's, they're not making any more helium. And then I found a company, I found a couple of companies that are, have been at it for a while, but never have quite gotten there yet. And then I evaluated the management and I, I decided I was going to invest in Royal Helium. And while I was doing my research on Royal Helium, I saw a press release, Royal Helium Private Placement. And I said, what is that? I had no idea what it was. And so I went and looked. And to me, it was, it was starkly obvious. You can either buy the shares on the open market for five cents, or you can participate in this thing called a private placement, which back then I knew nothing about what it was. And the shares are the same price. And they'll throw in a full warrant or a half a warrant. In this case, they threw in a full warrant for seven cents. And I, I read this over and over and over again. And I, I, I just, it was one of those moments where, why isn't everybody doing this? You know, if you've decided that's a company you want to invest in and they offer a private placement, why isn't everybody doing it? So it but, really- but did, they, did, they, did they like pre-announce their private placement? Yes, yeah, yeah. And they offered it on uh, it. When I started searching for Royal Helium private placement, I hit the Stockhouse website. And on the Stockout website, and I cover this in the book, there's a subsection called Deal Room. And in the Deal Room, there are lists of companies who are offering private placement. This was the first place I found where I could get a list of the currently offered private placements. And the, the really cool thing about Deal Room is they walk you through the whole process of opening up the special offer, reading it through, signing the check boxes and then si digitally signing the document at the end. And then they tell you where to send your money, you know, your, your wire. And I sent in the money and I get my communications back. And next thing you know, I'm sitting on some restricted shares in Royal Helium. And uh, that was June, 2020 that I purchased those, uh, purchased the, the special units uh, into the, the private placement. And it was the fall of 2020 that I started bugging you <laughs> to, you know, start something and show us all of these other companies that you had been researching so that we could learn more about your approach and why these companies, you thought these companies were of value. And um, that led you to starting Microcap Explosions and then Oracle and the Oracle conference call. And I had totally forgotten about that. You know, I had totally forgotten that I had asked about if you're going to do a private placement, can we participate in it? I, I totally forgot that until you, you reminded me in your video. And, um, and the only reason I asked that question was because I had just in the last few months learned about private placements. And I had participated with the Royal Helium one. And by um, November, Royal Helium shares were at 26 cents. And they still had not hit the big discovery, which came in the spring of 2021, where they found what they believe is the third largest helium find in Canada, right? Um, and the management, these guys have been at it for 15 years. They've got depth of experience. They have one of the largest land holdings. I mean, management hit good. The insider holdings of Royal Helium was very high. It was up in the 20s to 30%, which meant management had a stake in the game. And, you know, we're running out of helium and helium is used in so many places. And this was the other thing that happened on my journey, uh, Mary, is I learned a lot. I learned a lot about helium and what it's used for. And now I know what Noibium is and how it's used to strengthen bridges. And the largest bridge in Europe that uh, connects France and Germany together, that bridge would not have been possible without Noibium because the steel would have been so heavy, it would have imploded in on itself. So there are materials like that. And those are rare earth uh, elements. And that's one of the things I'm very fascinated about now is, you know, China controls the rare earth element market. 
Uh, we use it in our cancer MRI scanners. We use it in um, NASA spaceships. And it's, it's a, a, the type of element that you can't create it. They have not figured out how to recreate it or emulate it or, you know, put it in the Star Trek duplicator machine. Um, and so it's a finite supply. And for all these years, we've been wasting it on balloons, party balloons, you know. So um, that's kind of how I got to the spring so, of so 2021. You, you put, so you put, you put in five grand. It was trading at five cents. Yeah. Uh, very soon it reached 20. Now, just for a reference, where is it now? It's at 50 cents. Wow. So you, 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 had, a, you had a 10 beggar. On my first hit. Uh, on your first hit. And, and that doesn't even include the warrants that you got. No, no, no. And I. So you took, you took like 5,000 and you turned it to like 70 or 80,000, something yeah. like that? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It's and in the book, I say, you know, okay, call me lucky, you know, sure. First time luck, you know, it happens to all of us, but I did do some research. I mean, I really thought about Royal Helium before I put my money in it, just like I thought about Oracle before I put my money in. And, and as you well know, you've brought a couple of private placements forward that I haven't participated in, you know, and that was one of the things you taught us is that, you know, don't invest in it just because I'm investing in it. Think about it investing in it because you want to invest in it for the reasons that you think are are valid you know and and so as i started to evolve the the, the narrative of these private placements and i have about 12 of them now that i'm invested in and uh, they're not all mining they're you know technology there's a couple of technology stocks that i'm very very optimistic about um because that's my area right i work in cloud technology data centers and they're building data centers now faster than they're building hospitals you know and we actually need more hospitals than we need data centers but they're building data centers unreal um you know azure alone or no it was google last year alone announced that they were going to build so many data centers over the next five years it would use something like the equivalent of a thousand eiffel towers worth of steel you know, uh, it's it's just a, a huge growing industry and COVID's made it even even bigger. So along the way, I wanted to develop a system whereby I would insert some discipline into my my approach. And that's where I came up with the Ponk, uh, the Ponk approach, which is the point of no concern. And I wanted to force myself to sell at particular spots that I had predetermined was when I wanted to sell. Um, you know, I don't have a huge capital base here. I have a very small capital base um, and I want to preserve that capital base. So I'm, I'm trying to be as risk averse as possible. So I developed the method where when the stock, I don't sell when it becomes unrestricted. I don't sell the minute it becomes unrestricted. Those are, I learned recently, they're called warrant snipers. You know, they get involved in a private placement. They, they buy the, sh they sell the shares as soon as they're unrestricted so they can hang on to the warrant, right? I don't believe in that. If I'm going to invest in a company, private placement, it's because I already believe that I want to invest in the company itself, first and foremost. And uh, then I look, you know, at the private placement aspect of it. But I'm, I've already convinced myself I, I would invest in that company. The private placement then is just the ice cream and the ice cream cone um, because the shares are the same shares. So I hold until the shares at least double and then I sell only half my portion because these are also companies that I believe I want to have shares in for the long term. I see their potential not this year, but in three to five years out. Um, which I think is part of, you know, your philosophy and looking at these companies that have value, but you have to, you know, buy into them and hang on to them, even when they're going through their ups and downs, as long as they are heading in the right direction and management still committed to answering the question, which is why they put the private placement together. Like the one, you know, we're participating in right now, they came forward, they said, this is what we want the money for. Um, and be it a new mine or be it uh, promoting a new technology, a new product or service. You know, management has says, this is what we're going to do with the money. So you get to follow them and see how they're doing. And if they're doing everything they said they do, then you know, the best thing you can do is hold on to your shares when they're going down, right? Yeah. And do because, you do you uh, always reach out to the management? Uh, uh, it's, 
it's funny. Um, in the book, I tell the story about um, yourself and uh, Rick Rule um, as well, because you're both people I follow very closely. Um, you, you talk about calling management. And in the book, I say, what? You want me to call management? So one of the companies I was looking at, I decided to try that because I'm, I'm trying to change my behavior and learn from people who are a lot smarter and a lot better at this than I am. And I realized to do that, you know, emulation is the fastest way to success. If you emulate somebody who's very successful, you have a much better chance at being successful. So I'm trying to be like that, um, that uh, lizard, the chameleon that changes his colors. I want to take the best of what you do and the best of what R Rick Rule does. And, um, and so I, um, uh, it, it was just a process of learning more about what they are. And, um, and to do that, I had to call management. And so one day I picked up the phone and I called management and the guy called me back. <laughs> and then I had to ask some questions, you know, and I had some questions written down. Um, and uh, he was very helpful. He spent about half an hour with me on the phone explaining the business. He was, and I told him right up front, I said, look, I've only got $5,000 to invest, okay? He says, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We, we want lots of diverse shareholders, big and small, you know? So he spent the time with me. And then I called a number of other companies that I was considering and um, pretty much two a one. They all called me back and they all answered my questions or they responded to my emails. So I'm no longer shy about picking up the phone and, and asking some questions, you know. Um, that tells me a little bit about management. You know, if they're not willing to talk to me, if they're too busy for me, um, then, you know, maybe our, our philosophies don't uh, don't match. Yeah, that's very interesting because when you are involved in these smaller developing companies, you can actually get the management on the phone they can help you. you. You have zero chance getting the CEO of Microsoft or, you know, Google to call you and explain to you things. Yeah. I mean, they might have IR departments to, to help you, but you don't get that kind of, uh, you know, customer service that you do with these smaller companies. Yeah. Yeah. And you can find out, I mean, during the process of having conversations, you know, there's only so much they can tell you, but in the aggregate of everything you learn and have been learning about that company, when you start talking, as you point out in Scuttlebutt Investor, which is a great book, by the way, um, the more you start talking to more data points, and that's people within the organization or, or customers of that organization or partners of that organization with all the other research and things you've read about, when you talk to management, some of the things they say, you start to go, aha, I see a relationship between this data point, that data point, and that data point. And they haven't told you anything they're not supposed to tell you. But that little bit of extra information can help you get a better picture of what's going on. Well, because the idea is to learn about the business. And it's the best to, you know, they can help you learn about the business. They can point you into the sources and directions where you can increase your understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that was, uh, I got over that hurdle. So I'd have no problems picking up the phone or emailing uh, people now. Um, um, and and so I put this system together, what we we're talking about there. So I, I only sell when the things have at least doubled. And then I have what I call the hold and exit strategy, which I determine what my risk ratio is. So the double half is basically when the warrants get worth more than double what I paid to exercise them, then I sell half. And now I've left with half my holdings. I've, I've recouped my capital base investment because again, I'm still trying to do to, trying to be very risk averse at this point. And I'm not going to make a lot of money because I'm not putting a lot of money in either. You know, I participated in Oracle, but I was probably at the very minimum end of the participation, you know. Um, so I, I still have to work on building my capital base and I want to protect it. So um, but at the same time, I want to hit those home runs where I find what I call a keeper. And right now I see the rest of my holdings in Royal Helium as just that. These guys have got three working wells now. In, in the space of 12 months, they have three wells that are actually pulling helium out of the ground. And they are currently shipping it for processing. But they are also in the stage because they just did another private placement. Um, only this time the private placement was with the big boys 
and they raised enough money to build a helium processing plant. So they're going to be taking the stuff out of the ground and selling the refined product, which is where the real money is, right? Just like the oil business, you want to make money all the way through the supply chain. And so they're going to be doing that. So I see that company as a long-term holding now. And for me, that's what I call Ponk level five. It's where you've, you've really established, you ended up with free shares. You, you executed on the discipline of your plan to sell shares and not wait for the top because nobody knows when the top is. That was something else I learned, you know, very clearly. Um, there's another great book I, I should share with you that uh, was written by a guy here out of Ottawa. He worked on Bay Street all his life. Um, and his main thing was nobody ever lost money selling, right? You, you're not going to make as much money, and I'm not worried about making as much money right now. I don't want to try and time the top. I just want to get a company that keeps growing, and as it keeps growing, I reduce my position ever so slowly. And you know, if you do the math, if you only ever sell half your shares, you will always have some. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how um, how was your thought process of going into, because Oracle, I think, was your second, second private yes. placement, right? Yeah. So walk me through your thought process there when you got first introduced to it. Yeah, what what again, I, I'm trying to learn from other people. So I looked at all the research that you had done um, for all of us to benefit from, quite honestly. And I could see that there was a real narrative, a real story there. And um, I, I, you know, I, I'm... I don't read through, uh, you know, 43101 do technical documentation. I don't have the expertise or the, the wherewithal or the knowledge to do so. But I can do comparisons, right? I can look at some of the greatest copper mines in the world. I can see what their tonnage is, what their extraction rates, you know, what their assets are and, and how good's the grade. And then I can compare that what it looked like Oracle was going to have. And when I looked at some of the best copper mines in the world and I looked at what Oracle has in terms of potential assets, grade, uh, you know, size, location to transportation facilities and all that sort of stuff. I go like, this is a home run. I mean, they've got stuff like it's just the grade is better. The, 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 the asset resource base is better. It's just a big discovery. Uh, and I think you saw that long, long time ago. So, um, and, and again, it was like kind of like Royal Helium. I came into the picture just as all of the things that you predicted and believed needed to have happen for this to go, they were happening just at the time I came in. So I was actually very lucky from that perspective as well. Um, and, and so that, you know, the, a number, like you say, there's no one reason, but there's a number of reasons. And for me, it was looking at the research you did, comparing the asset and the management to what I was seeing out there in some of the largest copper mines. And I believed that, you know, if it worked, it was going to go, go well. And then the opportunity to, you know, participate in a private placement so we could get them to that three, uh, the uh, three IP level, I knew was going to be a critical thing because everybody else is looking at the numbers, right? There's one famous investor, he says, show me, show me the grade. Don't tell me anything else, just show me the grade and I'll tell you what the place is gonna be worth. Um, so that was, that was how I came about it. And part of it, quite honestly, was faith in, in your knowledge and experience. Uh, I, I admit that fully. Um, like if you weren't going in on it, <laughs> I certainly wasn't going to go in on it, you know. So that conviction helped. And then the conviction of how many of us were there? 70, I think, went in on that private placement or 30 yeah, of us. 70 or 80, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you say, okay, well, if 79 other people are thinking this way as well, you know, that maybe, you know, it's, it's a good thing. So... So that was it. I didn't put in as much effort as I did with, with studying Royal Helium. Uh, that's well, for sure. because because here's the thing. You know, you were you were on your own on that with yeah. Royal Helium, and but it just shows you that you know somebody that is not a professional in this field can still participate in these things, can still you know evaluate them to their best of ability, and yeah. you know and you know, get lucky too, you know, because you, we, we all need luck in these things yeah. too. Well, and I look at it, you, you know, there were definitely some messages I wanted to get across in the book. Things like, look, 
you know, don't buy a lottery ticket, okay? Even I buy a lottery ticket once in a while, you know, I call it the tax for the stupid. Um, you, you've got a much better chance at investing in some of these companies that are on the TSX uh, Venture Exchange in Vancouver or the OTC or the Canadian Exchange. Uh, you have a much better chance at making money than you do, than you will ever have buying a lottery ticket, you know? Um, that iPhone that's going to cost you 1200 bucks, you know, there's one private placement I invested in. I only put in a thousand dollars and they let me, cause you know, as you know, normally it's $10,000, right. But it was on deal room and, um, they, they said, yeah, fine. And so, now all, all of your deals, all of the 12 deals that you did, they, they were all from the deal room. No, no, no. So Royal Helium was the first one through the deal room. Oracle was the second one. And that was where I l really started learning more about paperwork, you know, because they send you an email with your, with your subscription offer and you got to, you got to fill out the subscription offer. And then I started to see, well, you know, this subscription offer and that subscription offer, they're kind of the same format. They're supposed to be exactly the same. Just the numbers are supposed to be different. Um, but each, each company seems to have a slightly different variation of what a subscription offer is. So I had to kind of piece that together and learn about it. And I detail that in the book, I break down a subscription offer into where you need to sign, what this section is about, that sort of thing. And, and the important stuff, like what's the offer, you know, what's the price, what's the exercise price of the warrants, what's the restriction date, what's the expiry date. Um, and, and so, um, uh, Oracle was that way. And then what I started doing, and this goes back to pick up the phone and call management. I started searching for companies I was interested, but I added private placement at the end. And I started seeing all of these press releases come up and some of them would say, you know, they've announced it. In other words, you miss the boat. And that's, that's one of the challenges with these things is you, you got to see them coming and you got to be willing to pull the trigger fairly quickly when they do happen because they last a week. You know, the window opens and the window closes a week later. And so even with some of these companies that had said, we've, we've closed, I would write to them anyway. And, and I have a simple example of the email I send in the book. It simply says, um, in the subject, it says president's list. And then I say, hello, I'm either a current investor or I'm thinking about investing in the company. Are you going to have a private placement in the near future? Or I see you're having a private placement. Is it too late to participate? And in three instances, they wrote back and said, hey, we're doing an over allotment. How much would you like? So they, they reached their target of raising, say, $10 million, but they were oversubscribed. So they've asked the commission to allow them to do another $2 million, let's say. So just because the press releases come out doesn't mean you've missed the boat. So then what would happen is if they said, yeah, we can, you can participate, they'd send me the subscription offer. I'd fill it out, put in the amount I wanted. And I think in only one case, they said, no, you have to go in for the full, you know, the full amount of 10,000 or something. But in, in a lot of cases, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 2,750, you know, uh, they, they allowed me to participate. Um, and uh, so I, I started documenting my process for asking to participate getting the offer, filling out the offer, how to send your money in uh, through a, a bank wire, uh, what to fill out, and then what to keep, what records to keep. And I put together the punk game, as you know, and the whole idea of the punk game is it's a way of keeping track of your the private fl placements you invest in, right? And then uh, the ones that you, you invested in, when it comes to the warrants, um, for those people that don't understand what warrants are, take a few moments and explain what a warrant is. And also tell me what kind of warrants you've received. You, you mentioned like half a warrant, full yeah. warrant. So, but start, start with explaining to people what a warrant is. Yeah. So I, I put together, as you know, that ice cream cartoon, right? The ice cream store cartoon where you walk into the ice cream store, you, you come into my ice cream store and on the counter, I have two things, two products. That's all we're offering. One product's the ice cream cone. One is the ice cream cone with the ice cream in it. And they're both five cents. And you look at me and you say, Arnold, what's the deal here? You know what's going on? Um, and I say, they're exactly the same ice cream cone. Um, it's just my boss told me this is what he wants to offer to customers today. You can buy the ice cream cone with no ice cream for five cents, or you can buy the ice cream 
uh, ice cream cone with ice cream for five cents. And so you buy the ice cream cone with uh, the ice cream and you walk away bewildered. Well, if you, if you think about private placements, I only invest in private placements of publicly traded companies, pretty much. And so I can buy the shares on the open market. That's the ice cream cone. In a private placement, I can buy the same ice cream cone shares. They're restricted for three months where I can't trade them. But after the restriction period, I go through the forms. I deposit them in my investment account with the Royal Bank of Canada. And they're my shares. And they're the same as the shares that are trading on the open market. The difference with the private placement is that not only do you get the ice cream cone, which is the share, they give you a sweetener. And the sweetener, the ice cream, is the warrant. And what the warrant says is, look, for the next three years, you can buy more shares of this company at a predetermined price. So Royal Helium was five cents to buy the private placement unit, which came with the share and the warrant. And then at seven cents over the next year, I could exercise the warrants, purchase the shares for seven cents, even if on the market, they were currently trading for 25 cents. And so you fill out the paperwork, you send it to the company, you send the money, usually directly to the company, to their treasury. They send you your certificate, which is either a paper certificate, ideally not, but some companies still do, or they send you what's called a direct registration statement, a DRS statement, which again, I have copies of in the book, so you see what they actually look like. Um, and you just deposit those shares in in the uh, in your account. So when I bought my 20,000 Royal Helium shares at seven cents, it cost me $1,400. I deposited those, uh, those converted warrants, I deposited the shares in my account when they were trading at darn near 48 cents. You know, so uh, do the math kind of thing from seven cents to 48 cents. And you, you see it because you have to tell the bank, look, I bought these shares for seven cents because they need to put the amount you originally purchased in, in your investment account for that, sh for that company. And so they know what you paid and they know what it's currently worth so that the tax department can figure out the capital gains, right? So um, uh, it, it, it's really the warrant is a sweetener to get you to participate in the company's efforts to raise more money from existing and new shareholders to do whatever it is they want to do next, be it a new mine, mining exploration, or being uh, releasing a new product to market. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of time frame uh, of, uh, did you get in order to exercise those warrants? You, you mentioned 12 months, 36 months, what kind of yeah. range did you see? Yeah, so I've seen everything from I've seen as 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 a short as six months, which I think is you know way too short a time. That's way too optimistic. And then I've seen five years. There's probably four of them that I have right now that are five years. So you can exercise these warrants over the next five years at a predetermined price. Now they they um, and and you have full warrants where when you buy one special unit, you get a warrant that is equal to one full share. In other cases, you'll see half warrants where you have for every two shares you have, the warrant will allow you to buy one full share. That's called a half warrant. So I like the full warrants, obviously. Uh, I like the doubling effect. Um, and um, I, like, I like three years, two minimum three years. Royal Helium was only one year, actually, but I had no clue what I was doing then, you know. Um, and that was that was the offer. Take it or leave it. You, you, there's no negotiation here. If they say the warrant is for three years, exercisable at ten cents, that's the deal. Um, and then, well, and, it, and it also depends on the market and and the demand for for those uh, private placements. Because when we did one, uh, well, obviously with Oracle, we had 24 months to exercise them. Uh, but with with another company that I'm not going to mention the name. There was no warrant. There was no warrant at all, and there was no discount at all because there was so much demand for it. And and you're right. You, there, there's no negotiation uh, because there's other people at the table too. Uh, so exactly. Exactly. 
Yeah. The um, so the, the what the warrants really do though is they, if you manage to be lucky enough to pick the company that is going to execute on their questions on the story, the narrative, whatever it is they're trying to do. They get the momentum, they keep going. You're going to make money just from the shares appreciating because more of the market is going to see that this company is doing what they said they do. They're generating more revenue, they're getting more customers, they're selling more products, whatever it is. So the market itself will eventually recognize and appreciate what the company is worth. Um, but what the warrants do is that's like adding gas to the fire, right? Because the stock's already going up, but the warrants, they're, they're like um, the exponential increase in potential profit that a warrant brings to the table. The math is unbelievable. And I'm not even that good at math, but I can see, you know, this, that, bam, that exponent, that it's just exponential. When the warrants really kick in and, you know, the next thing you know, a warrants trading at a dollar and you, you can exercise for seven cents. I mean, that's just unbelievable uh, difference. And, and some of the companies will also have, there's an exception in the warrant offer. Some of them will say, look, you can exercise the warrant for the next three years at seven cents, but if it goes to 20 cents and it stays at 20 cents for seven consecutive days, management can pull the trigger, get you to exercise your warrants sooner than waiting until there's a, a huge amount. Because remember, this is going to be extra money for them. The warrants, when converted to shares, put more money in the treasury. It doesn't dilute the company. A lot of people think these things dilute the company. The company's getting the money for the shares, and they're also getting more money directly into the treasury from the warrants that you purchase afterwards. Yeah, that that di dilution is already accounted into it because it, it already happened. Right? Exactly. And you exactly. have to you have to send them the money uh, to get your new shares or additional shares. You got to send yeah. them the wire again. Yeah. Um, now, from the private placements that you've done. Because uh, on the microcap explosions since Oracle, we've done a total of five. Yeah. So you you yourself did like twelve. Did were there any that didn't work out, and and what did you learn from that? Well, it's a, that's a good question, and that's what I think book two is going to cover a lot about is because now things are rolling out. I really only have two private placements that are finished: Royal Helium and Oracle. All the other ones, um, one of the ones that we're invested in, like some shares just became unrestricted in it, right? Um, and uh, but all the others, I'm looking at October, November, and January become before they become unrestricted. Now, out of out of all of them that I have, um, there's probably about three or four of them that are under the water. In other words, the private placement was at 10 cents and they're trading at seven cents or something. And like one of them's a lithium company, for example, that has both um, a resource and also has a technology for that was developed at the University of Alberta, by the way, um, for refining the process of developing helium. So they're looking at potentially two strike points, uh, but they're at 7.5 cents. Um, they've they've did a second round private placement to move the project forward uh, that i did not participate in right so those shares have come that's actually the third one those shares of all trade have all finished i've exercised the warrants everything's in my account and in fact i haven't sold any of it i haven't sold any of the original shares and i haven't sold any of the warrants because the stock has not first doubled so it's not meeting my my system where the stock has to double and as you know with these these companies that we're playing with right uh, they can double in price in a matter of days or weeks very easily and they can e easily go down uh, uh by half price right i've seen that quite a bit um and and so i believe in this company they're they're below what i paid for them but I'm going to wait to see if management answers the question. And management is still trying to answer the question uh, that they use to uh, raise money for the private placement in the first place. So I have, I think, three of them that are, you know, 25, 30, maybe one of them's 40 percent under the under what I paid for them. But like I said, too, I was originally prepared to invest in them in the stock market only. 
and I saw them as three to five year investments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now um, just to kind of uh, conclude our talk for for the, for the people that want to learn about private placements. Obviously, I we're talking, so I suggest they pick up your book because you've do, you've done a lot of work on it, but other areas other sources that people can learn about private placements where what would your advice be to them yeah so um along the year uh, uh, over the past i guess 18 months that i've been doing this uh project um in the book i actually document all of my sources where i get stuff i give you the urls you can just if you get the kindle book you can click on it boom you're at the site uh, there's only two uh two subscriptions that I subscribe to. Yours is one, Microcap Explosion. And the other one is the Mining Stock Journal with Dave Krantz, because I like the way he approaches mining stocks. And oh, by the way, I was so disappointed when you put out that video series, Why I Hate the Miners. <laughs> it's, it's really good. And people should watch it. It's because that business is full of sharks, you know. But um, yeah, so he's the only person I pay. And I think it's 20 bucks a month or something. Um, I've seen on YouTube recently, and I don't know if it's the algorithms or it's just like when your wife is pregnant, you notice a lot more pregnant people, you know, or if you buy a red car, all of a sudden you notice everybody's got a red car. So over the last 18 months, I've seen a lot more websites come up. There's one right now that they're just a mouthpiece advertising uh, private placements. That's all they do. So I don't really see those of any value other than letting you know a private placement is available. But you know, let's be clear, typically with a private placement, they usually don't need to advertise these things. There are enough people with money that want to participate that they can generally raise the amount of money they want to raise. So if, if you see a company that that's all they're spending their money on is marketing the private placement, you have to wonder what business they're in, right? Are they actually in business to do something or are they in business to raise money? Um, so you want to be very careful about, you know, what is the company really trying to do? Well, because I think I think the point that you made uh, before is very important, is that you you first need to want to be invested in this company just in general as a yeah. as an open open market investment. And then if they do happen to have a private placement, that that's a bonus. That, that's how I approach my things, too. Yeah. First, first, they have to I want to be interested in them, period. And then I reach out to them and I say, hey, if there is a private placement in the future, think of me, remember me, because we can help. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, like I said, part of that is just writing them, right? Talking to them, telling them you're interested. It's called the president's list. Just ask to be put on the president's list. And they'll let you know when the next private placement comes in. It's, a, it's an automatic email out to everybody that's on the president's list. That's how you get invited to participate right you have to ask but they're they're private they're private most of the time so you, yeah. unless you unless you reach out to them you're not going to know exactly I exactly and that's why you know tongue in cheek i mean it's not a get rich quick book i think you you you'd agree with that uh, and the tongue in cheek part of it is you know reserved for the rich famous and well connected but it's true it's true you know, the average investor, and I consider myself, you know, whatever they want to call it, but I'm not a high roller. Um, so I don't get phone calls. Like if you got 50 or 100 grand, you want to throw into this thing, right? But that's how this happens. Um, and so these deals in potentially great companies are usually gone before the rest of us have ever even heard of it. Um, and so you, you got to be paying attention. And so the sources I get from, you know, there's certainly Stockhouse. There is a website now that's only been created in the last year. In fact, I only found it in December 2020 called just that, privateplacements.com. And they list every private placement that comes out. It's a great website, great website. Um, and when I found that, it was another one of those, I've hit the mother load, right? I've literally hit the mother load. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, they tell you what now, again, some of these, by the time they get listed, they're done. They're closed. No, I think, I think of it a little bit kind of like um, commercial real estate, for example. Uh, you have different websites like LoopNet or CoStar uh, that you might find uh, deals. But by the time they are listed on the websites, 
they're they already been shopped around many many times so the best yeah. deals you get in commercial real estate is when you actually uh you know reach out to the owners before the properties become uh, for sale and you yeah. you know you you constantly you know reach out to people and then when an owner wants to sell he calls you before it hits the market same yeah. thing with these private placements yes if you just wait and you want some website to just give you the deals well you know those are the deals that you might not want to be involved in but yeah. you know if you reach out to just look look through a lot of companies one by one and if you like this one this one or this one you know you can buy the shares and reach out to them hey if if there's something in the future think of me like you said yeah. uh, be put on the list yeah and typically typically before i even write to the company i have usually all already purchased like a thousand or two thousand dollars worth of shares yeah. uh, so i am invested you know and which goes to the the uh, part of the system which is i'm only going to invest in companies that i would be in, willing to invest into without the private placement so you you have to ask i make that very clear in the it's it's like the, the man said you know that famous quote in the bible ask and you shall receive you got to ask and it's the, everybody's pretty nice i've never had any nastiness yeah no problem we'll put you on the list and and two of my private placements that's how i got involved it was six months after I saw the company that all of a sudden I get an email. Yeah, we're doing a private placement. How much would you like? Right? Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, Arnold, let's, um, is there anything else that maybe you would like to share that we didn't discuss before we wrap it up? Yeah, like you said, I'm not a financial expert. I had my mutual, uh, mutual fund sales license when I was 25. I actually ran an IBM System 38. I ran the transfer agency for a $2 billion um uh worldwide equities uh trust and mutual fund company so I, I you know i had some background in that part but i'm not a mathematician the reason i got into computers is i hate math and i'm not a geologist i don't have a background in that but you know anybody that's got half a brain and can you know do some research um document their processes what they're learning along the way so it gets further encoded anybody can do this it, it you, you know you don't have to be a, a genius but you do have to put in your time that's something else i've learned is you know if you really want to know something you have to spend your time at it so but anybody can do it so i put the book together um if if you have no experience with private placements whatsoever i think you can pick up that book go through it and know, know exactly what you need to do and how to how to participate in the game um at the end of the book um and i think you'll be able to do like we've done do some research identify the company first the private placement is not the reason to invest in a company it's not the reason it's the worst reason to invest in a company because you're attracted to the ice cream you're not you're not looking at the value of the business right um and, and there are companies out there that just perpetually offer private placements. That's all they do. And the companies are recycled and whatnot. So you do have to do your homework. But I, I think it's doable by anybody. And I, I wrote it so that more people could participate in these things, Mary. Is they're, they're, they can be really, really rewarding. As you said yesterday, they can be really rewarding to people. I mean, change people's lives when you look at the exponential returns of a, of a good investment will do. Um, they're not out of the reach of the average person. You just have to know how to get invited. And I cover that in detail in the book. And the last thing is, don't invest money you cannot afford to lose. Never, you know, ever. Because some of these things are certainly more speculative. You're not investing in the Royal Bank of Canada. You're not investing in the Bank of America here. These are smaller companies that have very, you know, niche markets sometimes. They're very specialized in what they do and they're trying to grow and you're going to be part of them growing by participating in the private placement. And therefore you're taking some risk, but you, you have potential for huge rewards, but make no mistake with any of these investments. You know, you can lose money. You're not going to lose as much as you did on the lottery tickets, but you know, like any investment, it's uh, you know, carpum diem, you know, buyer beware. So I wish everybody good luck with it. I put my email in the book if you have, you know, and you've got my website. If they ever have any questions about my experience, I'd be happy to share what I've learned. Okay, perfect. Thank you for your time, Arnold. Well, thank you, Marius. I appreciate all you do for, for all of us there. Your insight into these things has been, uh, you know, a big eye opener for me. And it has changed, you know, it's changed my life as well. And it's been fun watching microcap explosions grow. It really has. And you're, uh, 
your your subscribership grow as well. And for good reason, for good reason.